Okay, we have been um, we have been trying to go through uh, to finish the book of Revelation, and we are now in the process of the, the studying the first part last. So we are we have been going through the seven churches. Um, yeah, we went through Ephesus last week. I was extremely tired, really. I was, um, and we kind of stumbled through Smyrna. But I was hardly ever so zoned out as I was last week. I could, there, there were certain points where I wasn't sure what I said. So I apologize. But I was really tired. I think I needed a good sleep and I didn't get, get to get it. But anyway, so this evening we're going to, we're going to continue. And um, we're going to continue by picking up with Pergamos. And um, let me just share my screen as we do that. All right, so we're in Revelation uh, chapter 2. And what, what, we, what we have seen so far, I'm at Corinthians, I don't know what I'm doing here, Revelation chapter 2. What we have seen so far is that these seven churches were actually seven literal churches that were in Asia, but... We believe that they are used by Jesus to represent something greater. Seven different aspects of the Christian church. And um, not just that there are seven different aspects, but it starts by putting the seven of them within a certain time frame. So it's like the history of the Christian church is divided into seven time frames. God, God divides it into seven because... In his way of teaching, in his way of expressing things, the number seven is significant. He could have made maybe eight periods or nine periods, but seven is a symbol of completeness. God uses it as com for com to signify completeness. So he gives us seven, seven churches to signify that this is a complete picture of the Christian church. So... It, 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 it seems evident that these seven stages cover seven ages. But as we pointed out, it also seems evident that each, some of these stages are overlapping. Even though it starts out by saying this church is in this period of time. But when it moves on to the next period, that first church does not disappear. It continues. The same elements move on to the next period. So that when you come to the end of time, when Jesus comes again, at least four of these churches can be found. Because Jesus mentions his coming to these four, to the four last churches. He mentions one of them, hold fast till I come. That means this church is going to be there at the time of his coming. So he mentions his coming. To, to, to the last four churches. So we believe it also uh, applies. It doesn't mean that when one stage moves to the next, the previous stage disappears. No. There is some overlapping, is what we were saying. So we saw Ephesus, and Ephesus means the desirable. And Smyrna was a, was a, a sweet smell, a, a perfume, smell of a perfume. And um, today we want to move on to the third church, which is Pergamos. And this begins in verse 12, Revelation 2 and verse 12. Brother David. Yes, Brother Matt. Didn't you also say that each church time period, um, well, let me say each each Christian in, their, in, in our characteristics um, can find ourselves having the same characteristics of a particular church quality, the qualities of the church in, those, in that period, and not necessarily um, has to be, it could be a conglomerate of characteristics intertwined into a person. Yes, or something like that. Somebody, yeah. somebody said it, and I agreed with the person, because, uh, yeah, that's what I think. I think that that... 
God God has, has given like many passages in the Bible there are several truthful ways in which the message can be applied and I think that one of the one of the, the meanings we see here is that each of these messages can be applied to our own personal experience at least some elements of the message I mean obviously some things don't apply because for example when it says to um, Smyrna that you will have tribulation for 10 days this is specific and it, it, it's not going to be true in, in a person's individual experience but there are things there that are said you know I, 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 for example I have something against you because you have left your first love this is a personal message that many Christians can see applicable to themselves and therefore they, they counsel I counsel you to do the first works we we can apply this on a personal level so there is that application as well brother Matt all right so anyway um we move on today to the, the church of Pergamos and it says in verse 12 Revelation 2 and to the angel of the church in Pergamos write um, I just want to comment again each week we kind of touch on this a little bit and each week I keep coming back to it it's interesting that the messages are addressed to the angel or to the messenger and it's interesting too that even though we see that this is applicable to a, a church or the church in a time period Jesus speaks as though he's speaking to one particular church because the message is addressed to the messenger to the angel the messenger of the church in in Pergamos it's 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 it's, it's a kind of interesting interesting greeting interesting address because you have to ask yourself is he speaking about some particular minister because even in Pergamos the church the literal church of Pergamos it did have I suppose there was an elder there might have been a, a bishop in the area there was an elder there and if you apply this to an individual church what what who is God talking to is he talking to the church elder I mean if this is so then you are saying that my goodness there is a great deal of blame and accountability and responsibility on the elder because these messages are very strong and yet they are addressed to the elder or to the angel on the other hand you can think or is it referring to the Christians of this age who carry this message and I'm kind of leaning in that direction when he says to the angel of the church in Pergamos to the messenger of the church in Pergamos to the Christians who live in the age of Pergamos I, I, I want to interpret it that way most of all because I don't really think you can look at a time in the history of the church and blame it on one person or even blame it on a group of persons like for example take the church today the, 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 the church the Christian church today which um, is very clearly in a lukewarm condition and if I were to ask you who is responsible and somebody might say well the ministers are responsible you might be partly right but then you say even the ministers are victims of circumstances all right I suppose I will always blame a religious leader who is lukewarm and who is not careful to feed his flock properly but at the same time in a way they are the victims of their age and the victim of their circumstances I, I am I am extremely for myself personally I'm extremely conscious of God's mercy because you must know that when I was a young Christian I am um, I attempted to go to the Adventist Theological College at the time it was called West Indies College I attempted to go there to train to be a minister and the thing is that I have to say by the grace of God although God's grace hardly seems visible 
in what happened. I became a father when I was 19 years old. And it, it, it's kind of like a policy of the church that if you become a if you become a father, if you have a child out of wedlock, you can never be a minister. I suppose it's a part of the church, the church image that the person in charge is spotless. So that was the grace of God. That was mercy because, well, maybe if I become a minister, it still doesn't mean that I would have stayed with the system. But I think I was spared a lot of the mindset a lot of the narrow-mindedness, a lot of the, the closed thinking because I never was able to pass through that system. I never passed through the system. So, who, who, who is to blame for the condition of many of the ministers? I think it's a system. You, you belong to a system where you are taught that God's way of preparing you for his work is you go to the school and you, you, you are prepared for the work by taking in, by studying Greek and Hebrew, and by, by learning theological approaches to the Word of God, and by learning how to be a good manager and how to manage people and how to be and how to control people. This is what you are taught. So, who is really to blame? It's hard to put your finger on one person or, or on one particular group because we are the church is the victim of history these things developed over thousands of years um things came into the church and they you know you you, you don't know the doctrine of the trinity who is to blame for it coming into the church we can look back and we can say well all right in the adventist church you have people like um leroy Froome, roy allen anderson ruben figure before that you had people like um like Prescott, who began to bring in things. But before them, in the Christian church, you had Christians, you had Christians like D.L. Moody and um, George Muller. These people were strong Trinitarians. Charles Spurgeon, strong Trinitarians. How did they come to be like this? They inherited it. So who do you blame? Anyway, I'm saying a lot about this, and what I really want to say is, I just think that the message to the angel, it's focused, it's focused on the people of the church. I don't want to identify any particular set of individuals, because I think that every one of us in this room, we represent the angel of 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 whatever church we belong to, because we are the messengers. I am a messenger. You are a messenger. The state of, of Christianity today, we are a part of it. And, and the message is to you, and the message is to me. And whatever, whatever problems exist in the church in our age, we are a part of that problem. I think that's how Jesus is looking at it, right? So he says to the angel of the church in Pergamos, write this to the messengers who exist in the Pergamos period. That's how I understand him to be saying it. I don't know if I've made it any clearer or simpler or just muddied the water some more, but anyway, that's what I'm thinking, right? And I'm saying this because it's, it's a tendency that people have to blame other people and to point the finger and say, you are to blame. But I think it is most helpful, you know, Brother Matt was saying, you know, does it have a personal application? It, 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 um, and I'm saying, yes. It's most helpful if when you look at the message, you say, Jesus addressed this to me. And this way, we can better be able to, to, to apply the remedy to ourselves. So again, as we said, as we have said over the past two messages, each time Jesus is identified in a different way. In every one of these messages, he identified himself differently. In the message to Ephesus, he says, um, I am the one who walks among the candlesticks. When he comes to Smyrna, he says, um, I am the one who was dead and is alive. He comes to Pergamos and he says, I am the one which has the sharp sword with the two edges. So, 
he is systematically identifying himself in a different way in each of the messages and that is why you can know when you look at jesus and you see he has a sharp sword in his mouth he's walking among the churches he says i am he that liveth and i, I and i was dead each of those statements has a strong meaning it has it has an, a meaning you can't read this book of revelation and bypass anything it has a meaning and so he comes to the churches and, and in the message he identifies himself with a, with, a, with a different description each time. And what he's saying is, look at this description and you can find my, my relevance, my relationship with this particular church. So he says, okay, to Pergamos, the one who is speaking to you is the one who has a sharp sword with the two edges. What is a, what is a sharp two-edged sword? Let's just quickly uh, see what it says in the book of, I think it's Hebrews chapter 4, but I could be wrong. If I'm wrong, we'll look for the verse, but I'm, I think it's Hebrews 4, where it says, um, the word of God in Hebrews 4.12. Hebrews 4.12, thank you. It says, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And what's the purpose of it? It pierces even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The other thing I want to point out is that as you look at this message, what do we see? It, the book of Revelation is a carefully designed book. And it, the interesting thing about it, you know, sometimes people might question the inspiration of the Bible. They question, I mean, theologians, they like to say, when you look at the context of this passage, it is talking about so and so. This is true and it is helpful in many cases, but one of the things that we need to remember is that it's God's word and God is able to bypass context. Many places in the Bible, inspired people, they just bypass context. If you look at the meaning of the thing in context, you will never understand the other meaning that God gives to it. So Paul writes something here in the book of Hebrews. And in Revelation, God comes back and mentions the same thing. The, the sharp sword with two edges. How do you know what that means? You go back to the book of Hebrews. And yet John had nothing to do with the book of Hebrews. John, Jean, John, um, John may not even be aware. He might have been or might not have been aware of what is written in the book of Hebrews. John would not have known that this book would eventually find its way into the Bible. Because remember at this time, they did not have a New Testament Bible. This was compiled and put together years afterwards. So, God is seeing into the future and God knows that we will be able to understand this reference to the sharp sword because it will be in the book of Hebrews. So God is designing this book of Revelation based on his foreknowledge of what will happen in the future. When the Bible comes together, the book of Hebrews will be there. And all these references that he makes, many places in the book of Revelation, it's based upon things that were in the Bible before or that were later put into the Bible. So this sharp sword with two edges, it represents the word of God and it represents the word of God in a particular role. It represents the role of the word of God in reaching that place where the soul and the spirit are divided. Now I have to tell you that I am not quite sure how to perfectly understand this, okay? I know that we have the Bible speaking about a person being made up of body, soul, and spirit. Paul says this in, in Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians, I believe. You're, I pray, God, that your whole body and soul and spirit might be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord. So there's a body. We are familiar with the body. That is easy to understand. But then he says, your spirit, and then he doesn't only say the spirit, he also says your soul. What I understand is that when we are speaking technically, it is not correct to refer to the spirit as the soul or vice versa. There is a distinction between spirit and soul. And um, I mean, even today when we were discussing about the spirit, I think one or two people might have made that, um, they might have, have just 
overlap between the spirit and the soul. But the Bible here says that the word of God is able to reach to that point where the soul and the spirit can be divided or where they can be separated. You can separate between the soul and the spirit. But the thing which can make that division or that separation is the word of God. And how do we understand this? Well, let me tell you uh, my, my, uh, my, thought, my thought on it. I believe that the soul, I'm just going to say some things generally without being able to prove it. There's a, there's a video presentation I did which is uh, called The Living Temple where I try to, and there's another one associated with it called um, Spiritual Realities. And in those two presentations, I try to address this issue of the body, the soul, and the spirit. And so I might give a better explanation in those videos. But what, what I'm going to say right here and now is that a little earlier on, I asked Brother Tony, what do I mean if I say, what do you think I mean if I say, I like your spirit? And Brother Tony was, was feeling to find a way to explain it. And I understand because I feel, I'm feeling to find a way to, I can't express it properly. If I say I like a person's spirit, as he said, it's the atmosphere around the person. It's the attitude of the person, right? There's a spirit in this room. What do we mean? There's a kind of joy. There's a kind of, 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 of uplifting atmosphere. Something about a spirit has to do with attitude more than an intellectual thought. Your intellect is your brain. And, and when you read the Bible, the, 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 the message goes first of all into your brain. It does not go directly to your spirit. God is able to communicate with your spirit through your brain. And sometimes he does it directly by putting, a, putting a, a, an impression in your spirit. Somebody says, I have a burden on my spirit to pray for somebody. Where did that burden come from? What does that mean? You just feel a, 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 an impression. It's not, it's not intellect. Because nobody said to you, pray for this person. You got no message to say, pray for this person. All of a sudden, in your mind, there is a strong impression to pray for the person. God is communicating with you and he's bypassing your brain. He's going directly to your spirit. But sometimes... The message comes through your, through your brain. Like, for example, we are studying this evening and the message is reaching your brain. And then from your brain, certain impressions are reaching your spirit. And those impressions that are coming to your spirit, they are, they are, they are serving to change the atmosphere around you. They are serving to change your attitude. Now, this is kind of my understanding of soul and spirit. The soul, the soul has to do with that place where your spirit where your body and your spirit meet together. You call it, you refer to it as a soul. But the soul is not the spirit and the soul is not the body. It's kind of like the meeting place. And like I said, I'm not, ex I'm not going to go into the details this evening because it's not our, our theme this evening. But at the same time, Paul says here that the thing that can make that division between your soul and your spirit, you can't do it, but the word of God is able to reach that place in that deeper part of your being, the word of God is able to reach that place so that the word of God can communicate with your brain and then find a way to access your spirit. This is what he's saying. Because he says, this word of God can distinguish between the soul and the spirit. And he goes further to even look at it, to figuratively, I think, the joints and the marrow, right? He's kind of comparing the spirit and the soul here to the bones, the giants and the marrow. And he says, this word of God is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The word of God is not an intelligent thing. I mean, Jesus is, but the, the actual written word is not an intelligent thing. It cannot discern or read your mind or say anything. But what I understand him to be saying is that when you read the word of God, it brings into your, into your, your awareness Things that are hidden in your heart that you never knew. And I can well understand that. You read the word of God and you become aware of something in you. you you're aware of some hidden thing that you never saw before. Or you, never, you, never, you were not aware of before. I found this happen to me many times. I, I, I came to understand myself better. 
I came to understand the way my mind works. I came to understand the way my spirit works. I came to understand my relationship with God in a different way because of what the Word of God said. So, anyway, after that long preamble, what I'm trying to say is that Jesus says to Smyrna, I have the sharp sword with the two edges. I, I, I have the capability. I am the one who has the capability to reach into that place in your innermost being and to understand what is happening to you on the inside and to understand why you are this way. So um, that is why he identifies himself in this way because something is going on with Pergamos. Something is going on with Pergamos and he, wa he wants them to know that I am the one who can see deep inside and understand that place between motive and behavior and the inward feelings and attitudes. So the first thing that he says to them, I know thy works. It's interesting because this is how he begins several of his messages to several of the churches. And I think this is so important. I, I really like this because there are so many people who have a, a warped impression of themselves. They have a distorted perspective. Like David Clayton might think that David Clayton might think that he's a he's a good Christian. Why? Because a lot of people compliment him. He might think that he is a, 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 a he's not in those who are lukewarm. And so, you know, he might have been a person who studies the Bible a lot, and so he has this this this, this opinion of himself. What Jesus is saying from the beginning, I know your works. And I appreciate that because we cannot, we cannot, he's really saying, you can't, you can't deceive me and you can't get, you can't get me to make a wrong impression. I know exactly what, what, what kind of things you are doing. I know exactly the way you behave. That's a part of my portfolio as the one who has a sharp two-edged sword. So right at the beginning, he's saying, when, when Jesus says, I know your works, what I'm, what I'm, I'm hearing is, Please listen to what I'm going to say because I know what you are. I mean, it works both ways because for some people it says, hmm, I'm under judgment, I better be careful. But for some pe people it says, hey, for some people it works otherwise. It is, it is a statement that says, um, you're not appreciated. People don't understand how you are, you are fulfilling my will. But he says, I know your works. In other words, I am the person who appreciates what you are doing. So it works both ways. He can say, I know how bad your behavior is. Or he can say, I know what is happening, the good things that nobody else knows. But in any case, it is good to know that the Lord knows our works. And so therefore, all all. All that we should be interested in doing is simply to please the Lord and to not care about what even our own assessment is and what the assessment of other people is. We, we, we belong to the Lord and that is the important thing. He knows our works and so he is, the one who is, he is the one who is able to make a proper assessment of us. So, He says, and I know where you live, even where Satan's seat is. Now, I, I, I read a commentary that this, the, the city of Pergamos, it was in, in a location where there was a, it was a seat or a center of Satan worship. In fact, I'm going to read, um, a little commentary here. Let me just put it on the screen from um, one of the Bible commentaries, Jameson Fawcett and Brown Bible commentary. I don't know if you'll be able to, to see this, but um, it says, it says, Aesculapius, was worshipped there under the serpent form. Now, most of you, I, I think, might know who Aesculapius is. If you have ever seen the, 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 the symbol of the medical profession, 
two serpents, two winged serpents intertwined around a pole. This is a symbol of Aesculapius, the winged serpent. And it, it, um, it's, it's very interesting that the medical profession, this is a symbol of the medical profession. It's very interesting. I mean, I don't know what to say because people in general have a very positive view of the medical profession. And doctors, I think, on the whole, set out to um, save people's lives. But the symbol for the medical profession is, an, is, a, is a symbol of Satan worship. And the, the, this symbol was predominant in Pergamum, which is, which is a place to which this message of Pergamos is addressed. Um, it says there were uh, fanatical devotees of Aesculapius, and through them, of the supreme magistracy at Pergamos, they persecuted one of the Lord's people named Antipas. They persecuted him to death. All right, so Pergamos was actually a center of satanic worship. Literal Pergamos, the literal Pergamos. And um, we also believe that during the, the Pergamos period, it was also a time of Satan worship beginning to come into the Christian church. If you notice, there is a correspondence between the seven churches and the history that we look at under the seven seals. So, for example, the first church, Ephesus, and the first horse, the white horse, both of them would, would kind of overlap over the same period of time, the, the period of the early church. And then the next church, Smyrna, the church that suffered persecution for 10 days, and, and Jesus told them, I am the resurrection, I am the one that liveth and I was dead. It, it kind of corresponds to the next period uh, uh, of the horse, the horse, the horses, the red period, when peace was taken from the earth and the church suffered a lot of persecution, but it was beginning to change. And then the third period, Pergamos, corresponds to the history of the third horse, when the church was black, represented as black, and it, the nature of it was changing. And Pergamos is kind of like that. It lives in the place, in this age, in this period of time. Paganism was entering the Christian church, was taking over the Christian church. And when I say the Christian church, you know that primarily, during this period of time, the Christian church was mostly the Roman Catholic church. It was the same institution that became the Roman Catholic Church. Now, this is something that a lot of people may not be aware of, that the first Christians, the first Christian organization, let me put it that way, the first Christian organization that started with the Apostolic Church, it continued until the center of it was in the city of Rome. And this is what became officially this, the Roman Catholic Church. This is why the Roman Catholic Church believes that it is the true church of God going right back to the apostles. They say they can trace their history back to the apostles. They say no other church can go back that far and therefore they are the true church. This is one of the reasons why it is so important that we understand that you, you define the church not by the organized structure but by the invisible the invisible identity, the church is made up of those who are born again, not those who belong to a certain denomination. This is what we understand and what we emphasize. The church is made up of those who are born again. In other words, only Christ can define the church. So when, when the organized structure became the Roman Catholic Church, that was not the church of God. That is only the church of God if you live under the illusion that you can take God's church and lock it into 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 a denominational structure. We have, we have abandoned that thinking. We don't believe in that anymore. Because wh when you think like this, it's easy for Satan to put you in, in, in an organized structure. And then, what does he do? Then he simply changes the structure and everybody goes with it. This was what happened in the old covenant, but he makes a new covenant where he does, this is not how it operates anymore. For those who have learned the ways of God, we don't identify ourselves anymore 
by denominational identity. We are identified because we are born again of the Spirit of God and we have the life of Christ in us. So, the church was changing. This is a process that began long before. It took hundreds of years. From the time that the Apostle Paul was alive, he says, the mystery of iniquity is already at work, even from the days of Paul. And Paul said, I know that after my, de my departing, grievous wolves shall come among you, not sparing the flock. So, so the apostles were aware that something was coming. You know, I, I am told that the, the, the early Christians were even praying for the, the empire of Rome to remain in charge because they knew that when Rome went, something worse was coming. And indeed, we, 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 we think of persecution from pagans and we think of the, the slaughter of Christians. Many thousands died during the reign of the emperor Nero and the persecutions under the empire under the emperor Diocletian. But the far greater harm was done in later years under the Roman papacy when they started to not only to, 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 to pervert the faith of Jesus Christ, but eventually ended up severely persecuting and slaughtering millions of the people of God. Religious, religious tyranny was far worse than political tyranny. So anyway, this is what was happening during the Pergamos period. The, the pity and the papal thinking was becoming firmly established. It was during this time, I mean, if you, if you, take, if you, if you divide the church history into periods, which some people do, you would say that until about the year AD 100, around about the time when the last apostle died, you would say you are in the Ephesus period, the White Horse period. Then the next period is that period where you have the Red Horse, the Smyrna period where there's persecution, and they would, I beg your pardon, they would kind of divide that up uh, to, to about from AD 100 to about AD 313. And then the next period would begin from there to about 538. And, and, and during that period was when you had the great councils of the Christian church. It was, it was in 325 that the Trinity doctrine was officially established. And I think it was in 321 that they, they established Sunday worship. They made Sunday laws. And um, it was during this period of time that they were morphing paganism into, the Christian, into Christianity. They were bringing in the, the worship of Mary, the worship of... of um, Ashtaroth, the worship of Semiramis under the, 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 the name of Mary. They were bringing in Sunday worship. They were bringing in the Trinity from paganism. They were bringing in um, purgatory and the, 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 the celibacy of the priesthood, priests that never got married, all the things that you see in Roman Catholicism. These came in during this period when the, when the persecutions of, of Rome ceased and the church began to become politically great, began to become very influential, to make themselves acceptable, they opened up their arms wide and took in paganism and actually renamed these pagan services and these pagan symbols and gave them Christianized meanings. So it was really the seat of Pergamos. It was where you had devil worship continuing to exist with Christianity and the Christians were accepting and and integrating both into one. So when he when Jesus speaks to Pergamos here, I think he's speaking to the true Christians, the true Christians who live in this era. Because he says, I know you are living there where Satan's seat is. The literal Pergamos, they were they lived in, in, in a place where which was a center for for pagan worship, Satan worship. And the spiritual Pergamos, the Christian church in that period of time, also was in an age when Satan was dominating everywhere. Paganism was taking over inside the Christian 
so-called Christian denomination. But he says to the people of Pergamos, the Christians of Pergamos, to the true angel, the true messenger of Pergamos, I know that you are holding fast my name. You are, you are holding to my name. And you have not denied my faith. Even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwells. So, you know, people believe that it might have been that there was somebody who was really named Antipas, who really died in a literal Pergamos. But um, what is, 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 what is more relevant to us is that we look at the broader understanding. Because the word Antipas here, it's an interesting word. We understand that anti means against. And pas, I'm not a student of the Greek language, but I, I've, I've read that the word pas is a der derivative from a word that means father. And um, the word antipas would imply anti-pope or anti-father, literally. And what it would suggest is that the Christians who were standing up against the invasions of the papacy because the papal church, the Roman Catholic system, was becoming well established. And those Christians who stood against it, they were being martyred. This is where the martyrdom of Christians started, by the papacy. Before this, you had had the martyrdom by the Roman Empire, pagan persecution under Nero and Diocletian. But now you're having the start of persecution from the so-called Christian church. And so the martyr here, refers to the Christians who are being martyred because they are standing up against the establishment of the papacy. Those who opposed Roman Catholicism as it was growing, the, this growing power of this political system, system this, this religious power that now had this power, it was being used to, to persecute God's people who were standing for the truth. So, Jesus says, you didn't deny my faith. You, my people, you, the true Christians, you, my messengers, you did not deny my, my faith. Even though some of you who were standing against the system, they were slain in this place where Satan lives. But then he goes on to say, but I have a few things against you. Like I said, there's only... Two of the churches where he, he does not mention that I have something against you. It's Smyrna and it's Philadelphia. But every one of them he identifies, he, he, he commends them. But he also identifies some of the faults that they have. And so he says, I have a few things against you. Because you have there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. Who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. To eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. It's, it's a little difficult to follow the message and, and to pick up exactly who is he speaking to. Because when he says you have, you have some there who hold the doctrine of Balaam. This to me seems to be speaking very clearly to what was happening in the Roman Catholic Church. So why does Jesus blame the true Christians for that? Because they are the ones who have been killed. They are the ones identified as Antipas, who is being slain by this false system. And yet Jesus says, I have a, I have a few things, because you, you have some people among you, some people in this time, apparently who claim to be Christians, and they hold the doctrine of Balaam. Now just pause a little to think about this doctrine of Balaam. What is it? Balaam was the prophet that was hired by King Balak to curse Israel. He could not curse Israel because Israel, as long as Israel were faithful to God, nobody could curse them. So what Balaam did, because he was somebody who understood the ways of God, he had been a true prophet of God, what he did was he taught Balak, he taught this king in order to obtain money. The king promised him money, promised to make him rich. And so although he could not curse Israel, he could not open his mouth. Every time he opened his mouth, nothing came but blessings. And finally, he, 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 he sold his soul because he decided, I'm going to tell this king how to destroy them. And he told the king, if you want to, 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 to remove God's blessing, put something before them that they can't resist. 
something to cause them to sin and then God's blessings will leave them and they will curse themselves. And what he told the king to do was to get some of the women from his own country. I mean, boy, the minds of men are so devious. They got some of the men, the women from, from Midian. Some of the women from this, the, the, the country of Balak. And they went down there among the Israelites and they started to entice the men until they started to come into fornication with these women in broad daylight. It's kind of amazing to me. Not only is it amazing that women behave in this way, but also that the men of Israel were so easily enticed. But the point of this, the point of this message is that God is saying that the doctrine of Balaam is that in order to make profit, he taught somebody how to destroy the work of God. That's the doctrine of Balaam. It's the doctrine or the teaching that says, if you are getting profit, it's okay to teach people to destroy the people of God. And, 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 and Jesus is saying, in Pergamos, you have some people who hold to this doctrine. And he's clearly speaking about what is happening in the Roman Catholic system because what they are doing is they are destroying the faith of Jesus for profit in order that they may have been profit. You, rem you remember that when we come to this period of time in, um, in the seven churches, I think this is a period where it is said that a measure of wheat for a penny and a measure of barley for a penny and see that you do not hurt the oil and the wine. Let me see if that is it. I think that's the same. I don't want to mislead us. Let me look and make sure that I am giving you right information. In Revelation chapter 6, under the, um, the third horse, let me see what it says. Yes. When he had opened the third seal, I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, a measure of wheat for a penny. And three measures of barley for a penny. And see that thou hurt not the oil and the wine. So I think when we went through this, we did look at what this means. What this suggests is that the word of God, barley, and the wheat, the word of God is being sold. And what it means is that people were for, for profit and for gain. There were Christians who were willing to compromise and to change the word of God. So this is the same period that we are looking at here in this Pergamos church. Same period, the period of the third, the third age of Christianity, if you wish. And Jesus is saying the same thing, but he puts it a little differently. And he says, this is the doctrine of Balaam. For gain, you sell the word of God and you teach people how to destroy the cause of God. And so Jesus says, Pergamos, I know that they are faithful people, but here also... There are those who hold the doctrine of Balaam. The church is changing. It's now mixed and divided. And there are those who have this philosophy that in order to profit financially, monetarily, physically, materially, they teach Christians how to partake of pagan things. They teach Christians to partake of pagan things in order to obtain benefit. You know, when I, when I read this, I can't help thinking of how very much alive this doctrine of Balaam is today. Listen to the television and listen to one of these, especially American televangelists. 90% of them, their message is that if you run into the church, that, that, that one of the goals of, of Christianity is to become rich and that um, if you are not rich, it's because God is not blessing you. And, and they teach you to compromise and they teach you to, I mean, the, 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 the standards of God are unimportant. What you do is give to the church. And if you, if you give to the church and you compromise with the world, if you compromise with the ways of the world and you take political sides and so on, you can progress, your, your religion can progress and prosper. These are people who, in some way, they embrace this doctrine of Balaam. They believe that for, for material gain, you compromise your Christianity. And this is essentially the doctrine of Balaam. It's in the garage.
I have to look for it another time. I can't look now. All right, so Jesus identifies this and he says, I have that little problem with you. He also says the same thing that he said to Smyrna. This doctrine of the Nicolaitans. It seems to be, be, be something that um, was prevalent in that time. He says, so also you have those that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which things I hate. And a, lo a lot of comment commentaries are a little vague about the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. They say it was some Nicholas of Antioch who um, had some particular belief. The last time we discussed it, uh, we discussed it. And um, let me see what comment they have on it here. Um, verse 6, we mentioned it in verse 6. It says in the commentary, we read it week, last week, was it our week before last? Um, but it's so vague that it doesn't stick in my mind. It says um, they are, let me read here, let me put it up on the screen where we can read it. I'm actually using a commentary here, an old commentary called Jemisha Fawcett and Brown. But let me see what they say. Um, yeah, it says that there are people who, who, like Balaam of old, tried to introduce into the church a false freedom. It's, it's like the same thing, the doctrine of Balaam. It says, these symbolical Nicolaitans are followers of, of Balaam abuse Paul's doctrine of the grace of God into a plea for lasciviousness. And just to translate that and put it in my own words, what it is saying, I mean, for me, this is, this is as good an explanation as, as any. I, I don't know who these Nicolaitans were. So I'm kind of going along with what is suggested here by this, this Bible commentary. But what they are saying is that these Nicolaitans were people who taught people that because you are the subject of grace, the way you live is not important. You can live anyway. You can live like a dog. And it doesn't matter because the grace of God covers you. And so it's another, it's another, it's another aspect of the doctrine of Balaam. You teach Christians it's okay to live in an ungodly way, in a loose way, if there is benefit in it. So... These people existed, this kind of teaching existed in the era of Smyrna, but apparently it's even stronger now in the era of Pergamos. So, it's a little more detailed in how it is explained here. You have those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, and you also have the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which things I hate, which is very similar. Apparently, this was the compromising church. This was the, the, the age when the church was changing, becoming evil, developing into something that was completely contrary to God's plan for the Christian church. So Jesus says, repent. And the word repent is, is simple, straightforward. It simply means, be sorry for your condition and turn away. It has been said that the word repent means to be sorry for your sins and to turn from them. But I like to say it means to be sorry for your condition because I believe that the main problem is not so much what you do, it is what you are. The, these Nicolaitans and these um, who hold to the doctrine of Balaam, it is what they are that is producing this result. Repent of your condition. Be sorry for your state. Recognize your state. And, and be, be, be sick of yourself to the point where you, you recognize your need of Christ. Turn away from yourself. And that is repentance. Jesus says, if you don't repent, I will come against you quickly. And I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. And again, you know, we are, we are here speaking of the power of the word of God. To not only discern 
what goes on inside of a person but if you look at revelation 19 the word of god is also the, the sword that he uses to destroy the nations he has a sword going out of his mouth he has a sharp two-edged sword and with it he smites the nation so the sword not only is an agent that divides between the, the, the soul and the spirit but it also is something it, it really represents the agent of the will of god the will of god reads your spirit and the will of god also destroys sin and those who embrace it so he says i will fight against them with the sword of my mouth the word of god will destroy those who do not repent verse 17 he says he that hath an ear let him hear and again this is how he ends all the messages he that hath an ear let him hear that's smyrna ephesus he that hath an ear let him hear pergamos he that hath an ear let him hear and you ask the question well i mean i i always am interested fascinated when i when i read this statement because i say everybody has an as i as an ear but i mean jesus is re really using what i would call a colloquial expression in jamaica we will say child or picnic make you so hard ears why are your ears so hard child why are your ears so hard and of course we don't mean that your, your ear feels like a piece of stone or a piece of metal we are, we are simply saying that the words reach your ear and yet the words are not penetrating to your 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 inner being the words are reaching your ears but you are not responding to what you are hearing this makes you hard ears this morning sister iris was listening spoke about some people that have wax in their ears that's another way of putting it <laughs> yeah brother morris is, is putting posting it sister iris used the word this morning it's 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 really a a, a way of saying you are going through the physical process of hearing but you're not going through the spiritual process of hearing because when you hear spiritually it changes your life you respond to what you are hearing and jesus is saying those who have an ear if you have a spiritual ear hear take heed in other words and i always like to read these statements when jesus says something like this it says to me david be careful to pay attention because he wants you to experience a change and you can only experience a change if what you hear enters into your spirit and makes that change let him hear what the spirit says to the churches the one who has an ear let him hear what jesus is saying the one who overcomes to the him that overcometh i will give to eat of the hidden manna now the hidden manna i understand to refer to jesus himself there's a special relationship between jesus and his people here jesus refers to it as the hidden manna all right we 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 all of us have an experience with christ but the ones who are able to allow him to work in their lives in a special way they enter into a special relationship with him where he's able to feed them in a special way and for me this refers to the hidden manna you know jesus put it another way when he says every scribe that is instructed for the kingdom of heaven is like a man who brings out of his treasure things new and things old when jesus has you in his hand when jesus holds you because you have given yourself to him one of the things that you find is that you're constantly being fed you're constantly getting things that you never knew before it's one of the things i really love about about where god has put us i love it one of the things that i have been accused of is that i, I always like to bring out some new doctrine i mean somebody said that the reason i left the, the church is because i wanted to find something new and then they said the same thing when i i came to to understand righteousness by faith they said it was because I, i'm looking for something new to talk about and i find it a little bit amusing because i, I do agree that um 
my ears are always open. My eyes are always open to see whatever I can learn. I admit it, right? A brother sent me a link and he says, I would like you to listen to this. I find it very appealing. In this link, there's a set of people who are saying that um, Jehovah in the Old Testament was Satan. It was Satan pretending to be God. Because that Jehovah in the Old Testament, he was so brutal. And they said it could not be the true God. It had to be Satan. I watched a little bit of it. I watched as much as I, as I could stand. But the point I'm making is, I look. Because I'm always wanting to know, do I have something to learn? It's an arrogant person who thinks he knows everything, right? But there are some things that when you go to it and you look at it, you know, hey, I'm going no further with this. And, and that was one of those doctrines, okay? But at the same time, Jesus says that if you are his, and this goes for every one of us, if you are his, and, and you, 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 you respond to what he's saying, he gives you the hidden manna. He takes you into his secret place. And he feeds you with things that are not available to other people. I love that. I love that. And I, I, I think that I can say that I have experienced the truthfulness of what our Lord says. I've experienced it. I can say that without, without, some things are hard to say because they sound a little way. They sound like you are trying to be, be self-centered and so on. But no. I, I can tell in my life that, that the Lord has taught me things that I did not learn from a theological school. And I never learned from sitting at the feet of other people who taught me. There are things that Christ has taught me by giving me of this hidden manner. And I know that the rest of us can say the same thing. Those who are his friends, you can tell the same thing. He teaches those. Who, who, who give themselves to him. He says, furthermore, and I will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name, written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. And um, I think we read that somewhere else already in this book of Revelation. And we understand that this new name, this, this new name refers to, I think it's referring to the 144,000. But it says it also here to Pergamos. A, a new name refers to a new experience. So this message to, to, to those who overcome in, Smyr, in, in Pergamos is very intimate and it's very beautiful. The one who overcomes will eat the hidden manna and he will, re, he will re receive a new name that he alone knows. The new name signifies a new experience in the Lord, something that you and Jesus alone are privy to. Nobody else can know this name because nobody else has this, this experience. Don't you feel that way about your experience with Jesus? I mean, I feel this way. I know it is the truth. I know him as my friend. Sometimes I say, I know you have many friends in the world. What right have I to feel so special? But then the thing is, I know that in my relationship with him, I am special. You have your special relationship. That's between you and him. That is your new name. Nobody can know it except you and him. But I know that my special relationship is for me alone. And nobody can get in there. It's me and him. And that is where I live. And that is where I dwell. And that is what I rejoice in. It's the new name that nobody knows except the one who receives it. It's experience. And nobody else can get it. It says, that is what I will give you when you overcome. So, this brings us to the end of the, the message to Pergamos, and also it brings us to the end of our study for this evening. Um, I'm, we're going to be doing it this way, one church per Bible study, unless we go pretty fast, and it doesn't seem that we're going very fast at all. So I just want to close this evening and about, with appreciation for everybody who has participated in this study. And as always, before we have our closing prayer, I'm going to pause a little bit to find out if there are any questions or comments if there are comments i promise you i'm not going to respond too much because i i'll be resting my voice a little bit but if there are questions i will try to answer 